Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly meeting. I hope everybody's doing fine. I can see you. Great. Good. Guys, we're going to start it, uh, talking about addendums, you know, a little bit more addendums that we had last week. Uh, some very important addendums that some people have been asking me, what do I do if the buyer needs to sell his property uh, in order to close into a new property? So there's an addendum for that. It's, it's a little difficult to get the seller to accept it, but I have uh, experience where it happened. It was, it was a good result because we had the property under contract. If you don't have the property under contract, it's going to be a little difficult. If the property is only in the market for sale, but you don't have it under contract, it's hard to get a seller to accept that. And I'm going to show you all the process that happened to me related to this addendum on this property. Let me share you my screen. Okay, so you guys can hear me well? Yes, no? Yeah, I hear you really good. All right, good, good, great. So this is the addendum, okay? It's called sell of buyer's property. Let's give you the example so you guys understand what we're talking about here. Let's say you get a buyer, and that happens a lot. A buyer wants to buy a property, but he needs to sell his property. And we were trying to do, you know, basically almost at the same time. So the buyer needs to get the money from the sales in order to complete the transaction. But you don't want the buyer to lose his deposit in case he doesn't sell his property. So that's why you're going to use this addendum. The addendum says like this, this contract is contingent on the sale of and closing of buyer's property located at, then you're gonna put the address of the property. My example was a buyer selling his property in New York. They were retiring and moving to uh, Florida. So they need to sell his property in New York to get the money and close the deal in the property here in, in Florida. Upon entry into a contract for the sale of the buyer's property, buyer shall give a seller a copy of such contract. Uh, with the third party's identification and purchase price information. If the sale of buyer property does not close by, then you put a date, buyer may within three days thereafter deliver a reading notice to seller, either terminating this contract, in which event the deposit shall be returned to buyer, so that's how you're going to protect the buyer's deposit, or thereby releasing buyer and seller from all further obligation on the contract. Uh, waiving and removing this condition and all finance contingents and continuing with the contract. So buyer has the option um, to continue and to cancel, okay? If the buyer can secure a finance and the buyer doesn't want to lose this property, then the buyer will secure a finance and then continue with the contract. If the buyer really needs to sell the property and that's the only condition, then the buyer will exercise his right to giving a reading notice and cancel the contract. Again, there are situations where the seller will not accept that because we all know that anything can happen when we sign a contract. It can close in and may not close. And the seller want, doesn't want it to be tied to a contract with the possibility not to close. But if you get it done, it's good. In my case, the seller accepted, but he sent me another addendum. And I'm going to show that to you. And you guys cannot accept that addendum. And I didn't accept that addendum. I, I um, oriented my, my buyer <clears throat> not to accept it. So let me show you this addendum. I believe it's this one here. This one here. Look. You guys can see my screen, right? Mm. Right here. You see my screen? Yes. You see the kick out clause? 
Yes. All right, good. That's what the seller put it, a kick out clause. It's a way to eliminate our uh, condition upon buyers selling the property. And this is what he said. Seller will have the rights to continue to show the property and solicit and enter into bona fide backup purchase contract with third parties that are subject to the termination of this primary contract. Upon entry in a backup contract, seller will give a buyer a copy of the backup contract with the third parties, identification and purchase price information. To continue with this primary contract, buyer must make an additional deposit of 5,000 to escrow agent within three days from receipt of the backup contract. By giving the additional deposit to the escrow agent within three days, buyer waives all condition for financing and sales of buyer property and the parties will close on closing date. So that eliminate everything we did. They wanted to show the property, that's what it says. Now, making it an easier way for us to understand is that they say this, I'm gonna to continue to show the property. If I get a, a buyer interested in the property and they wanted to put a backup offer, we're gonna accept the backup offer. At this point, me seller will send you a copy of this contract and you will have three days to make an extra deposit of $5,000. And you are going to waive all the conditions upon you selling your property. Meaning, if you don't sell your property, you are still obligated to close. And if you don't close, you're gonna lose your initial deposit plus this $5,000. So you see the X that I put here, I eliminate that. Buyer did not sign the contract. And I, I told the seller, seller, I'm very sorry, buyer is not going to accept that condition. If you want to continue with this, then we're gonna to have to cancel the contract. Um, or you accept it and we'll continue the contract. And luckily, the seller accepted and we were able to continue with the contract. Luckily again, the seller, the buyer was able to sell his property in New York, transfer the money to the title company here in, in Florida, and we were able to continue with the contract to close. So this uh, addendum here, which is the sale of buyer property, it's on your um, on form simplicity. You can find that on form simplicity. So if you have a situation like that, you already know that you have a way to make it happen. Okay? Any questions? Good. We'll continue. Now, home inspection disclosure. I've seen a lot of ages that they don't do the home inspection disclosure. Home inspection disclosure is important if the buyer is exercising his right to do an inspection or if he decides not to do an inspection. I had a situation with the buyer. He was buying a property in Wynwood. And Wynwood, the apartments there, basically all the buildings are very fairly new, you know, about 10 years old. All concrete, you know, the, the ceiling, it's all concrete. Um, so the, set, the buyer was very comfortable that the unit was okay. And he said, you know what, Alindo, I'm not gonna spend $250 doing an inspection. He was buying cash. And um, I can go there and look into the outlets and see if there is electricity. I can turn on the AC, see if the AC is working. I can look into the water pressure. That's basically what the inspector is going to do on an apartment. So, and there is no wood, so there's no chances to have any termites. So I don't want to do the inspection. He has the right to refuse to do inspection. What I don't want is that in the future, he finds out that there's something wrong with the property, then he comes back to me and I have no way to prove that I, um, gave him an option to do an uh, inspection and he refused. So that's why we use this disclosure. And we use it on both ways. And you know what, it happened. After closing, when he got the, the key, he walked into the apartment and the AC was not working. The day we went there, the AC was working, but after closing, AC was not working. 
Luckily for the buyer, it was just a switch that was turned off inside the unit, uh, which you have access from the corridor on the, on the building. And he didn't have to spend any money to fix it. It was just a switch that was turned off. We just turned on the switch and then everything was working again, but could be worse, but I was protected. Let's look into this. Broker and its associates recommend that you exercise any rights you have to obtain a survey, appraisal, and a home inspection. A home inspection is limited visual examination of the systems and components of a home. A home inspection may not reveal any defects that are not readily discoverable through a limited visual examination of the home. So they understand that there are things that might not be able to be seen. You may also not review any building code violations. You see how you protect yourself even if he wants to do the, the inspection? You may wish to ask your home inspector for a written contract to detail the scope of the inspection as well as any agreed upon fee for the inspection. The fee you pay to your home inspector is paid outside of closing. So he's gonna have to make a payment uh, by the time of the inspection. And it's not a part of your closing cost. Such fee is due and payable at time of inspection. Home inspectors are regulated and licensed by the state of Florida. Buyer acknowledges that the broker and its associates make no representation concerning the competence of any inspector's contract and or repair persons. You agree to hold harmless, then you put the name of your brokerage and its associates from any liability or damage results from a home inspection. Now, let me go back here. Buyer elects as follows. Let me see if I can find this thing here. Yes, let me put this thing here. So you see the whole form. Okay. Buyer elects as follows. Buyer elects to perform any or all recommended inspection or not to perform any recommended inspection. If you elect to proceed without the benefit of the above mentioned inspection, you agree to hold harmless. Then here goes the brokerage name and its associates from any liability and damages resulting from such election and then the buyers will sign. That, you're gonna keep this on your files, you're gonna to give to uh, Alexa, a copy of this signed by the buyer. We're gonna keep this for five years. If in the future, buyer, buyer uh, decided to come after you because of anything that he founds out after the inspection, we still have the document saying that he agreed to hold us harmless, the brokerage, and the agents. So that's a very important agenda for you to put it on your package. And don't forget that. Doesn't matter if the buyer will do the inspection or if the buyer is not going to do the inspection, it's good to have it. Now, the walkthrough, it's also another document that I've seen agents that they don't take with them when they do the walkthrough. The walkthrough, we do the day of the closing, prior to the close. Sometimes if the close is in the morning, then we do the walkthrough on the day before. And if the close is in the afternoon, we do the walkthrough in the morning. And it's important to have the buyer sign this and you will understand why. Property address, the purpose of this walkthrough is reinspection. Reinspection is solely to satisfy buyers regarding the condition of the property. Access to the property was provided and utility were provided also. So you need to make sure with the seller's agent that the utilities are turned on prior to closing because the buyer is going to have to do the walkthrough. You will need to turn on the lights, turn on the air conditioning, you know, to, uh, turn on the water and see the water running. Okay. Now, Buyer's representative acknowledged that all required parts and replacement have been made, if there is any that needs to be made. The maintenance required has been met if you require any uh, maintenance 
uh, on your contract. The property is in substantially the same condition as on the effective date, meaning the date that they signed the contract, except for normal wear and tear. All items of the personal property included in the purchase are on the property and or the contractual obligation have been met, except as if there is anyone that was not met, then they, you're gonna list them here. And then the buyer will sign it. So if the buyer in the future said, well, there's something wrong with the property that we didn't see on the walkthrough, you are not gonna be responsible for that because the buyer signed. And let me tell you, I've seen a lot of agents that they go to walkthrough and they don't take the uh, walkthrough disclosure, okay? So put this also in your package. Commission agreement. We had a situation not, not so long ago that we need to do a uh, commission agreement between two agents. Two agents that could be from the same brokerage or it could be from a different brokerage. Now, you, some people, they forgot that we cannot share our commission with anyone that is not licensed. We can only share our commission with the licensed person or any parties involved in the transaction. Meaning, if I decided to give part of my commission to the buyer or the seller, I'm okay to do so. I just need to disclose it to all parties. Everybody needs to know that I'm giving part of my commission to the buyer or to the seller. This is legal, okay? Not legal is to give my commission to unlicensed person that it's not part of the transaction, buyer or seller. Now, in this case here for this one, here, it's a commission between brokers, okay? Or agents inside the same brokerage. And that's what it says. Seller, um, now this is, this is more like a, a commission, not between brokers, between seller and broker, because the other one also is a referral agreement. That's what we're gonna talk soon. So this is an agreement that you have with the broker. Example, let's say you have a buyer and that's a for sale by owner. So you wanna make sure that the buyer will give you a commission and you wanted that in writing. You call the seller and you say, Mr. Seller, I have a potential buyer for your property. I wanted to take my buyer to see your property. And I am, uh, what I wanted to know is that if you're willing to cooperate with brokerage, if this buyer buys the property, you will pay me a commission. And then the buyer tells you, the seller tells you on the phone, yes, I will pay you a, a commission. Then you make the agreement to make it official. Remember the statute of fraud means that to be enforceable, it must be in writing. If you don't have anything in writing, you cannot enforce it in court. Now, then you put the seller's name <clears throat> and then you put the broker's name and may show and will use a diligent effort to sell. And then you put the property address and you put the buyer because you called him and you said you have a buyer. So you need to put the buyer's name here. In the event of the property being sold uh, to the prospect or any other property, prospect procured by broker on, then you put the date within, you put how many days you want it. The seller agrees to pay the broker. And then you put here a percentage of gross purchase price. That's what you are agreeing with the seller. Mr. Seller, if I bring the buyer, and the buyer buys the property, you agree to give me 3% of commission. Then the, buyer, the seller says, yes, I, I, I agree to give you 3%, and you put the 3% here. And the seller and the broker, will sign at the bottom of this agreement, okay? This agreement, commission agreements between broker and seller or landlord. You could use also for landlord. This is what I was mentioning before, you know, referral agreements between brokers. Then let's say you have a buyer, okay, that wants to buy a property in New York. And you find an agent in New York because you cannot be part of the transaction in New York because you're not licensed in New York, but you can get commission. You cannot go to New York, show property and do all the transaction because you're not licensed in New York. But you can refer this buyer to an agent in New York and the agent in New York will uh, show the property, do all the paperwork and at closing, they will pay the commission that you guys are agreeing on this. Some people ask me, Orlando, what would be a fair commission? Okay, 
as we know in real estate, everything is negotiable. Everything is negotiable. Um, in general, what we try to work with is that I divided the work of a real estate transaction into four uh, parts, okay? Part number one is to finding a buyer. Part number two is to find the property. Part number three is to show the property. And the part number four is paperwork. So if the work of a real estate transaction is divided into four parts, if I take 100% of the commission divided by four, means that each part is worth 25%. This is not written in stone. You can try to explain to whoever you are receiving a referral or giving a referral. But again, at the end of the day, it's going to be a decision that you guys both are going to make. So if I found the buyer or if the person found the buyer and he referred them to me, then he's going to get 25% because he's responsible only for one part. I'm going to have to find the property. I'm going to have to show the property and I'm going to have to take care of the paperwork. So I'm going to work a lot more than he's going to work. So then he's going to get 25 and I'm going to get 75. That's what I'm going to try to do. But at the end of the day, we cannot get greedy because a percentage of something is always better than 100% of nothing. If you're getting a referral and it's a huge number and the guy wants more than 25% and he's only giving you the buyer, what are you going to do? If you don't accept, he's going to go to somebody else and you're, you're going to get 100% of zero. That zero doesn't pay your bills. Now, sometimes it's better to get into an, a, a fair agreement and you walk away with something. Good? And here you're going to complete how your commission will be paid. In general, we put 3% of the full commission received by broker B. Okay? It's a percentage of the full commission. So whatever uh, they decide, that's how much you're going to give it to them. Okay. I want to show you a few things here. Let me bring this here. I'm going to try to do a zoom in here. I'm put a little bit more than two. Okay, guys, this is a very important step when you take a listing or when you have a buyer. Those are the questions that you need to ask to the HOA if you are representing a buyer. If it's a rental, it's a different type of uh, questions. Actually, you have to get, if you are taking the listing, representing a seller. Because many times I call to a selling agent and I ask you questions related to the association rules and regulations and they tell me, oh, I don't know. I need to find out. Or they give me the phone number of the association for me to call them but it's not my job, right? It's the seller's agent job to get all the information from the association and make it available in the MLS. Now, for you guys to, to you know, give some example, we all know that we need to know if the association accepts pets. And sometimes they do go to the association and ask you, well, is pets uh, allowed in the building? And they say, yes, pets are allowed. But they forgot to ask the most important question when the answer is yes, is uh, how big can the pet could be? You know, because sometimes they have a restriction of up to 20 pounds, or some of them could be more than 20 pounds. So let's say that you only ask if they allow pets, and then you put in the MLS, yes, pets are allowed. And the buyer comes with the German chapter, 55 pounds. They sign a contract because you said that pets are allowed, but you didn't mention the restriction. So when they go to the association for the interview, they're going to mention that they have a dog, which is a German chap of 50 pounds. And then the association says, I'm sorry, but we only allow up to 20 pounds. We're going to have a problem. Okay. So as a selling agent, you need to get all this information. Number one, to provide the information to the buyer's agent. Number two, to protect yourself. You know, you cannot uh, misrepresenting the seller or giving a, a, a wrong information, okay? So those are the questions that you guys need to ask.
I'm going to send this file to you on the chat, okay? What is the monthly condominium fee and what does it pay for? What does it cover, you know? Because you need to know if the um, water is part of it. Some of buildings, they say the AC is included on the association fee. <clears throat> Some says that the cable is, is included and the internet is included. So you need to know what are you paying for? What is it included on your monthly payment? So that's why you need to ask the question to the association. Sometimes the seller doesn't know. Maybe the seller is an investor and he never knew what is included or not. And you need to get in contact with the association to get all those questions answered. Are there any contemplated or pending special assessment? Have you had the 40 years recertification? If you guys don't know, every building has to go through a 40 years recertification when they reach 40 years old. And if they did not reach the 40 years uh, still and they are about to get, you know, one year more, two years more, or they're just on the 40 years, and if the, the building, the association doesn't have any reserves, we know there's going to be a special assessment, okay? We know it's gonna be a special assessment and the buyer needs to know of that. So those are the questions you need to ask. If the building has reserves, and the question is also important because lenders, if you are financing less than 25%, the lender will send a condo questionnaire to the association this big. They wanna know everything. If you put 25% or more, it's only five pages. If you put 20, 24 or less, then they will ask all the questions, including two important questions that can kill a deal. Number one, reserves. Mr. Association, do you have reserves? If they say no, the bank won't loan the, lend the money in that building. Another question, how many investors? If it's more than 40% investors, a lot of lenders doesn't want to touch it. It's going to be like more like a, a, a cash deal or they need to put 25% or more because if you put 25% or more, those questions are not going to be on the questionnaire. So then the lender won't know. If they don't have a reserve, lender won't know. They don't care. And if there's more than 40% investors, also lenders don't care. They won't know and they don't care because you put 25% or more. But those questions need to be asked. <clears throat> Is there any minimum down payment required from buyers? You might have a buyer that's putting 5% down on a condominium, but the association requires a minimum of 20%. I had a buyer that he was buying a property in Tamarack and the association required 20% down and he was planning on 45. So he had to come up with another 15% in order to buy that property because he liked the community. His wife loved the community and he doesn't want to buy any place else. Even if he doesn't buy that apartment, but he buys another apartment in the same community, the rules still apply, 20%. So he came up with another 15% to purchase that, um, that apartment. So we need to know if the, um, the association has a minimum down payment, also a minimum uh, credit score, okay? There are some buildings on, I think it's King Drive here in Sunny Isles that they require 700 score. If you don't have 700 score or more, you can, you can rent it, you can buy. Are there any condominium rules that prohibit pets ability to rent uh, the unit or perform renovation? So you need to know because you, the buyer might be an investor and the idea of an investor is to rent. If the building doesn't allow rent, or you need to own the property for at least two years before you were able to rent it, that's not gonna be suitable for an investor. So those questions you need to know before they provide uh, a question for you. The buyer comes with the question. And this information you also put on the MLS. There's there are restrictions for rental. And you can say, yes, minimum one year, two years after you own the property, you can rent it. And what is the lease period? Can you lease for one year or less? Can you lease for, five, for six months? Can you do Airbnb? So all these questions, you need to um, answer them.
Let me see. Yeah. Let me see. All right. Is that a, a professional management company or is the association self-managed? So is the association has an office with an employees on the office and they manage the entire building or they have a management company to manage the, the building? How many units are owner occupied? So see that the question that we were talking before. This question will reveal how many investors we have in the building. If it's more than 40%, then some banks is not going to lend. Uh, do unit owners have exclusive easements or rights to use certain common areas such as porches, decks, storage spaces, and parking spaces? Buyer is gonna ask. If you have a building that's on the canal, they wanna know if they have a right to put the boats there, okay? So those are questions you need to know. Uh, how much money? is in the capital reserves. We spoke about this already. Do we have reserves? Yes. How much money you have in the re reserves? At least 10% of the annual revenue they must have in reserves in order for bank to lend. And this is very important question. Vehicles, are there any vehicle restrictions such as no commercial or motorcycles? So you might have a buyer that they have a motorcycle and they have a restriction, no motorcycle in the building. or he works with cleaning pools and he have a commercial vehicle and he needs to park his commercial vehicle inside the, the parking lot. And if you, they have a restriction about the type of vehicles that you can have in the parking lot, then the buyer won't be interested in buying. So you don't want to find the answer for those questions after you post your listing. You wanted to have the answer for those questions before you post the listings. And if you are representing a buyer, and you look into the uh, MLS, and then you see that a lot of these questions are not being answered, you get in contact with the selling agent and you ask those questions yourself. That's why it's good to have this questionnaire with you. And the same thing for rentals, okay? If you're representing the tenant or the landlord, you need to have all those <clears throat> questions answered, okay? And I don't want to forget, so I want to put this on the on our chat right now. Where do I have it? Let me see where do I have it? This. So I can send this to you guys right now before I finish the meeting and I start doing something else and I will forget. Let me put this thing in here. Okay, give me one second. Let me open here. Now, who wants this questionnaire? Tell me. I'd like it, please, Regine. Oh. Good, good, good. I'm only going to send it to I you. want it, Anna. Who I wants want it? it. Ah, good. If you don't want it, I'm not going to send it to you, okay? So you got to say, I want it. 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 <laughs> I want it too. Yeah, me too. Me too. Okay, I'm putting it on the, on the chat right now. Okay, I put it on sunny coast and I'm gonna put it on Remax as well. Okay, guys, you can access those through your... Don't forget about Nadia. The what? Which one? Nadia, Damien, don't forget to send me, please. Oh, okay, I put it on, the, on our group chat. Okay, you can download from the group chat. There is only uh, the sales. One or it, no, they are both on the same them. file. They are both on the same files. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is one file. The first page is for sales questions when you are representing a, a sales transaction. And on the second page, when you represent a lease transaction. Okay. So those are all the questions that you need to ask. If you're representing a seller, you need to, or the landlord, you need to ask all those questions. 
and you're representing a buyer, then you don't want the problem to show up after you sign a lease agreement or a sales contract. You want to know everything before. And that's our job. Okay. Good. Let me... Yeah. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, our market in terms of mortgaging. I'm going to start getting some uh, mortgage details whenever we cannot have the um, Loan Depot with us. Remember that we have a uh, in-house lender. So if you are work with a buyer that needs finance, please don't forget to bring your buyer to our in-house lender. Not just because they are working with us, because they are the best. So we already informed you guys, they are the 50 uh, largest uh, lenders in the United States. So we got Chase, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America. The first one is Quicken, and they are the 50 one. Uh, loan Depot. They do have access of many different loan programs that will be able to help your buyers. Okay, so try to use them whenever you can. Now, when you know more about the mortgage, the, the interest rate versus buying versus renting, you will be able to talk to people that are renting right now and they will be able to, to buy. There's a lot of people that they, they qualify for a for purchasing their house and they're still renting. And I have three slides here that I want you guys to have it, have it in your phone. So when you're talking to um, a person who's renting or are willing to rent in a property, then you pull up these three slides and then you show them the benefit of buying. That will, might convert a tenant into a buyer. And that's good for everybody. Because a buyer will not gonna, uh, a tenant is not gonna be paying landlords' um, mortgage. They're gonna pay their own mortgage, and it's good for you because your commission for the sale is greater than a commission for rent, and we can all agree to that. Now, reasons to buy a home now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prices will continue to rise. We 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 are in a situation that we've seen in many uh, areas. Price is going up. Anthony said yesterday that the price went up in Broward. So Broward is being a very hot area right now. I had one of our agents that she had a listing in, I don't know if it was Miami Lakes or Hialeah. She got 19 offers in one property. That's huge. That's huge. Meaning that the price is going to go up on the next sale because there's a lot of buyers and we don't have supplies. And we know that um, if we don't have enough supplies and we have a lot of demands, that is a seller's market. And the seller's markets will dictate price. So price is going to go and continue going up. And the most important thing is that the mortgage the interest rate for the mortgage today is the lowest in many years. And I want you to see that. I prepared this for one of the presentations we had and um, I want you to guys to, to see that and have it with you. You see, started in 2000, I didn't want to bring it much, but because it was like 6% before, 6%, 7%. I remember in, the, in 2005, before the crash, um, it was about minimum was 6%. And we, I had it because I worked with the mortgage back then. I had deals that was 90.75% interest rate and people were buying. So and I imagine now that we can get interest rate as low as 3%, even lower, 2.85. Now, I want you to see the difference when you purchase a property with the high interest and when you purchase a property with the low interest. Using an example of a $200,000, if the interest rate is 6% and you do it in 30 years, your monthly payment will be $1,199.10. If you get today, the same amount at 3% in 30 years, look at your monthly payment is going to be. And this is not the best. The best is still to come. 
You already saved me here about what? Almost $300 per month, okay? And the best comes here. It's the amount of money from your monthly payment that goes to your principal to amortize your loan. So if you get a 6% and you pay $1,199, you believe that because you're paying more, more money is gonna go to your principal. And on the second example, which is 3%, the monthly payment is lower, then less money is gonna go to a principal. You're gonna take longer to amortize your, your loan. But this is not the reality, look at the reality. A $200,000 loan at 6%, we calculate simple interest. We just multiply 200 by 6%, we get $12,000 interest per year. But I wanna know how much is monthly. So I divide that by 12, so I get 1,000 interest. So do you know what that means? From my $1,199, only $199 goes to amortize my principal. $1,000 is for interest. Let's see the second scenario. Same 200,000 but it's 3%. Times three is gonna be $6,000. Divided by 12, we get 500. $500 goes to interest. And all the difference, which is <clears throat> 343, goes to amortize your loan. So which one is better? You paying less and more money goes to amortize your loan. Look at this. 199 minus 1,000, 199 goes to your principal. On the first month, you still own 199,800. On the second example, you got 200,000, you pay 843,500, $343 goes to your principal. So your principal is a lot lower on the second month than on the first example with 6%. So it's a very good opportunity right now to get number one, a lower down payment and a possibility to pay off your loan faster. Now imagine if you think about it, well, I could pay $1,200 a month and I'm getting 800. So what are you gonna do with this $400 difference? You can send to your principal. If you send $400 to your principal, you may knock out about 120 months, about 10 years of your loan. So you may pay off in 20 years instead of 30 years. So this is a good thing, right? And this is the, the third uh, slide that I want you guys to have so you can show them. If you are renting a property, what does that mean after 30 years, if you never purchase a property? If your monthly payment is 1,250, in 30 years you pay $450,000. You could pay a home. If you are paying, let's say, $2,000 a month, after 30 years, you pay $720,000. So that makes a lot of difference when you're talking to a buyer, a family that's it's renting a four-bedroom apartment or three-bedroom apartment when the monthly payment will be $2,700, which is not difficult. It's, they will, you're going to show them that after 30 years, they pay a million dollars. And a property that they are renting for 2700 the price for their property is not going to be a million dollars today. It's going to be way less. It could be like $400,000, maybe $500,000, right? And um, they can get a loan with the help with the government. We saw already many times who was on that one-day meeting for the first time home buyer, and also many times Loan Depot also brought that subject to us. Um, we have many different pro government programs that helps with the down payment. $10,000, $30,000, $50,000, $80,000. Uh, Lori, one day we were talking on the phone and she said that she was working on a deal in Fort Lauderdale that the bank gave them $70,000 to help with the down payment. So this is another plus, right? Now you just get, need to get yourself in front of people. It doesn't have to be a buyer or someone that is looking to buy. It could be someone that is looking to rent or renting right now. They're not even thinking about it, but when you show this to them, you, you're gonna make them think, you know? Food for thoughts. You're gonna call them or get in contact with them. Look, the reason of my call is to give you food for thoughts.
And then you explain this to them, all right? Uh, guys, we are getting to the end, so I need to pass to John. John, are you with us, John? Hi, Orlando, yes. Hey, how you doing, John? Good, good, how are you? Good, thank you. John, once again, my friend, thank you for being here with us. Do you need um, to be the host? No, no, I'm just going to talk about a couple things in the market. So no, I do not need to show the screen. Okay, let me see if I can find you because I don't find you. What is your name on our chat? John, FCE, but I don't need to, sh you don't need to share it. I don't need it. Oh, I found you. Yeah. All right, great. All right, so basically in the last 10 minutes, I wanted to talk about three topics. The first one is some recent real estate news. Basically, as most of you hopefully realize now that the home sales in South Florida is heating up. Um, not only for medium price homes, but also for the luxury market. So what's causing this? It's basically three factors, right? There's the increased demand from the Northeasterners New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, low inventory and uh, historically low rates. So buyers are looking in South Florida and what they're technically not looking for is what it used to be is location, right? Location, location, location was the important thing. Now, not so much so. Uh, buyers are focusing more on the home type and its features. So they're looking for larger lots, homes with more square footage, for things like home offices, larger kitchens, entertainment rooms, and even learning rooms for the children if they're doing stay-at-home schooling. And uh, because of low interest rates, 60% of these buyers are getting loans compared to 42% from last year. So with these types of buyers, make sure to get that pre-approval letter from the lender. I know Home Depot is, is quick with that. So try and get that whole uh, pre-approval letter so you don't waste your time taking these buyers around. And so how long is this gonna last? Well, analysts are expecting this trend to continue through the remainder of the year and even into the spring of next year. So that's good news. So let's say we do have a buyer, we have a deal that you wanna negotiate. Um, I found something that says here the seven words not to say when negotiating a deal. I thought this was interesting. So one of the words is don't use the word can't. Use it means won't, right? So instead of saying you can't do something, find an, uh, an option that you can do on the contract. Uh, instead of using the word if, which makes you sound weak and not confident, try using the word when you can do something. But Sounds like you don't appreciate the other person's position. So instead of using the word but, try using and. Uh, the word hope, uh, instead of using hope that you'll do something, try using the word that you will do something. No or not, instead of saying those, try and find out things that you can do and yes to certain things that you're able to do. The word should, instead of using this word, try using the word willing. And the seventh one is try, which I just say try. Instead of using the word try, uh, use the word will. Uh, so as we know, words are important. So just be conscious of the words you're using when you're trying to get a deal for a client. Uh, and then the third topic was, okay, so let's say you have a deal, you have a purchase, but now you're in a bidding war. Uh, according to Redfin, last month, August, Offers on single family homes were involved in a bidding war 56% of the time, followed by townhomes at 54% and condos at 41%. So overall, that's basically half of the time you submit an offer, you might be engaged in a bidding war. So this is some crazy times we're in right now, um, but it's good. So what are some things that will help you and your buyer win one of these bidding wars? Uh, the first thing, the most important thing is be educated as the realtor. Know as many facts as you can about the property and the area and be prepared to move fast. Homes are getting three to five offers within hours of listing 
in some areas, those homes are going over 15 to 20 percent of the asking price. So here's a couple more tips uh, to win a bidding war. Uh, and I found this actually does work. Have the buyers write a love letter of sorts, you know, to the seller, describing a little bit about themselves, their family, uh, adding pictures of the family is great. Um, the letter should include things like why they want to move into that property, or what they know about the area, um, and why they would be the best buyer for this seller. That goes a long way because it puts a face and a little bit of an emotional attachment to this buyer than just a simple contract. Um, as a realtor, you might want to consider when preparing the contract, lessening some of the contingencies, right? So we've spoken before on time frames for certain contingencies. So now we might want to consider lessening those uh, to win a bidding war such as a deposit, you know, normally it's three or five days. Uh, you might want to consider reducing that to one or two days. They can wire that to our office in a day or two. Inspections, um, instead of the standard 15 days, you might want to consider seven or 10 days to make your offer look stronger. Uh, if the buyer actually wants zero days, like Orlinda was saying earlier, make sure to include that addendum that they're waiving the inspection period. I don't recommend waiving inspection periods as our lender actually was saying, but if you have to, if the buyer wants to, make sure to include that addendum to protect yourself. And also another shortening time frame would be the closing date instead of 30 or 45 days. If it's a cash buyer, you might want to lessen that to maybe 20 or 25 days. Um, be prepared that some sellers might even ask for the buyer to eliminate certain contingencies. So be wary of that. Things like waiving the appraisal or even the mortgage contingency. Um, I caution against this. I'm not too crazy about it because it does leave the buyer's deposit at risk if the property doesn't appraise or they're unable to get a mortgage. But if it's something that the buyer wants to do, uh, in order to win this purchase, maybe they have backup cash or whatnot. Um, make sure you explain all the issues with waiving these certain contingencies uh, and then allow them to make the final decision on their own. So basically at the end of the day, you just wanna make sure your offer stands out from all the other offers. And those are just a couple of tips that you can use. So that's it, Orlando. Just wanna give a couple of updates on those. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. I have a question to you, John. Hi, hi, good afternoon. So the quick question is about um, what if the contract was broad and we're already in um, almost to finish the purchase, but there is a missing letter in uh, one of the buyer's last name. What document is required and who can, who should do this paper just to make sure that, that we fix the name and the transaction in original sale contract? Well, the easiest and quickest thing that we can do is uh, do an addendum, basically correcting the uh, seller's name, um, have all parties sign it. Another easy way is just crossing or adding that to the first page of the contract. But I'm not too crazy about that. I don't like to change contracts after the run. So a, a clarification addendum is the easiest way. And if you need help with that or the wording, let us know. We can prepare that for you. Okay, so I should just write the addendum, send it to you guys to review that the wording is correct, and then I can have the seller and the buyer sign and agree that we can change the name. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. All right, Joan. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input. It's very good. Always, always. Guys, if you have any questions, uh, I believe John is always available. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying that for you, but I know you are. You already told me that. So if you have any questions, John is always available. You can ask John or you can ask myself. And I'm also always available. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or send them by the the chat, okay? I'm ending our meeting today. It was a great meeting. Thank you all for being here. We had 19 people with us today. Very good meeting. Thank you. 
I'll see you Thank guys. Thank you so much, Orlando. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you. Great meeting. Bye.